Here's my story about how I achieve financial freedom. I bought my first apartment building when I was 18 years old, an eight unit apartment building, no money down and cash flowing. And I basically had a mentor that basically taught me how to do this. Unfortunately, my goal at the time was not to achieve financial freedom. I was 18 years old. I don't think I knew the term yet, but I just wanted to prove to myself that I was able to invest in real estate, that uh, what I was seeing and hearing about real estate investment was true and real, and that it could be done, and I could be making money without having to work at it, without having a, a job, a traditional job. And basically, when I bought this eight unit apartment building, I was able to achieve that and realize that for myself. So that's the first part of it. I was 18 years old. And then when I looked at the, the problems that I could see here was my biggest problem that I, I thought I had was money. I don't have money. When I wrote the check to apply for the mortgage, I think the check was like $100 and stuff like that. And I had like $150 in my bank account at the time. And I was like, well, it better work out because that's all I have. I'm going to be eating peanut butter for the rest of the month. But the reason why I'm telling you this is that it's important to realize what value you have and make sure that you have a goal. So I guess my goal at the time was to prove to myself I can make money and I achieve that goal. But there could have been a bigger goal that I could have achieved in somebody who could have told me or I could have realized or I could have been driven to realize that and maybe I want to be a real estate investor and you don't need money to do this. You can do it other things. And really the value that I had at the time was time. I had time. I had tons of time to do this. But in fact, in order to buy that eight unit apartment building, I had to analyze over 400, maybe 500 apartment buildings of different sizes and all that kind of stuff in order to find that one that actually worked with a seller that was actually willing to give me a vendor take back or a seller financing on 20% of the property. So realize your value, make sure that you have big goals and that you can see sometimes you, you have some goals and you don't see the opportunity that's around you. And what I didn't see when I, the opportunities that I missed then was that I had time, I would have been able to maybe talk to other investors, I was introduced to other real estate investors, and I could have realized that, hey, you know what, I can bring value to them. I can find them deals. I could do the, you know, kind of like a wholesaler, or maybe get a share, a piece of their real estate for the work that I'm doing and stuff like that. And I could have kind of like ramped up a new career like that. I was kind of like, I wanted to finish my bachelor's degree, so that was kind of like, you know, on my mind, obviously, also, but you know, this is kind of like the idea there. Now, fast forward many, many, many years, I tried to do real estate investing in every city that I lived in, and I never had enough money. It was always too expensive because I was in big cities. When I bought that 18 unit apartment building, it was in a small town about 45 minutes or an hour outside of Montreal, so not in a big city, and I was able to find a deal there. But after that, I moved to Toronto. You can find a deal there. Later on, I moved to San Francisco. I had tons of money in San Francisco. I had uh, worked with a company that had gone IPO. I had tons of stock options. When I went to meet my financial advisor, he said, you've made it. Sell everything. You can retire for the rest of your life and stuff like that. And I hesitated for a couple of months because I was afraid I would pay a lot of taxes. The few months that I waited, basically the dot-com crash happened and I lost, I was basically wiped out except for a little piece of it that I sold. But I had a ton of money when I arrived in San Francisco and I looked all over the San Francisco Bay Area to invest in real estate, apartment buildings and all that kind of stuff. And it didn't make sense. Yes, I could have put money in there, but then my return on equity was horrible. It was like 1%. That's why I decided to leave it in the stock market which later on crashed, but that's why I decided to do this. After the crash, then I say, well, shit, I, I'm gonna have to work now for the rest of my life to kind of like be able to do this. My focus changed to let's find passive income. I wanna find passive income in business and whatever. So we started the low carb grocery store. Later on, we had a gourmet sauce company. We got, and the goal was always to get it big enough so that we can have someone manage the business and then we can kind of step away from it and then we, we have passive income coming from that. That was the goal here. We tried all these businesses and really none of them helped us achieve, achieve that goal. And that lasted for many years. Later on, we ended up like, let's rethink that whole real estate investing. We had different technology now. We had the phone, 
where we're able to communicate with people to the other end of the country, the other side of the world even, send pictures, electronic document signing, all that kind of stuff. We had all this technology, and that means that I was not kind of like anchored in the San Francisco Bay Area in order to invest. I could invest in other places. So that's when I went back to the drawing board or the white canvas, whatever you want to say, and said, okay, I want to build a passive income portfolio of single family rentals. Where do I go for that? I analyzed tons of data. I went to Census Bureau, Bureau of Labor Statistics, and tried to figure out which market made sense to buy single family rentals that would work. So I found a couple of markets, you know, four or five, six markets that, uh, that were really at the top of my list. One of them was Memphis and I had Cleveland, St. Louis. So these three markets, these are the ones that I went after first. In fact, we started with, with Memphis as the first one. The next step, once you have identified a market, you have to build a team on the ground. Obviously, I'm not in Memphis. I was not in Memphis at the time, so I had to find a property manager, a realtor, a contractor, all that kind of stuff, what we call the team on the ground or the boots on the ground to basically execute the project for me. People that I could trust and I have my phone so I could verify, you could send me pictures of uh, the rehab and all that kind of stuff. So basically, the first house that I bought, I hit a unicorn like right away. I think it was like $45,000, about $5,000 in rehab, after repair value $70,000. We waited for the season period, refinanced it for you know fifty-six thousand dollars. That was the mortgage that we got out of that. I basically had more money after that refinance than I had at the beginning of the rehab, and I had an asset that was cash flowing. That was a unicorn. And after that, I was hooked. I said, "Well, I'm just printing money, basically. Let's do two more in the same market." And then we did more and more and more. And then we also did Cleveland. Then we also did St. Louis. The reason why I'm telling you this is that now I had found a great opportunity. I had found a repeatable investment, not necessarily the unicorn, even if it was not like a unicorn, something that I would get all my money out, even if it was something that I was getting part of my money out that was good enough for me. But I had found a market, a team on the ground, opportunities and properties that could generate cash flow and all that good stuff. I had found the right investment and I had found the right team on the ground to execute and I had process in place and we started to build more and more uh, detailed process around that, but I had a repeatable investment in place. This is why I don't really like these apartment buildings. It's harder to repeat because if I'm gonna buy a 20 unit apartment building, I'm not gonna be able to find five, six, seven, 20, 20 unit apartment building in Memphis or in Cleveland. It's gonna be very hard for me to do that. It's gonna take me years to do that. With this, it's a repeatable process. I can buy one, I can buy two next month, I can buy 10, I can sell three, I can, you know. It's a repeatable process and I can do it consistently and have the level of consistency with my investment. So that's the kind of thing that I was looking for instead of like having these big things and then not be able to do that. After that, after seeing the results that I was getting, after seeing that it was a repeatable process, I could do these investments day in and day out, this is when I decided I need more money. Home equity line of credit maxed it out. I looked at refinancing the house, get more mortgage, and I realized that the house had tremendous equity that was kind of stuck in it. I couldn't max out the, the mortgage on the house. The house had increased in value dramatically over the last like 18 years that I had owned it. So the only way that I could extract that huge amount of equity was to sell the house. It was pretty obvious that this was what needed to happen, but then where would I live? And this is when you know I started looking at other houses. I knew that my wife uh, would not move in anything lower than what we currently have. So I had to look at houses that were better, that were bigger, that were in a better location, all that kind of stuff, that had like renovated kitchen. And everything was clean, ready to go and actually cleaner and readier to go than our current house that we had just renovated the kitchen and then we had we we're about to go in another cycle to renovate the bathroom again and all that kind of stuff so i knew i had to find okay where are we going to live so if i sell this house where am i going to live and i was able to find multiple houses that were for rent in better place that were bigger fully renovated, beautiful homes that we could rent for about the same price that it was costing me for the mortgage, for the insurance, for property taxes, for maintenance. 
I said, okay, well, I can sell this house and basically live in that other house for the same amount of money that I'm paying every month. So that's good. And on top of that, then I have this massive amount of equity that now I can use for investment. And I know what, where I'm going to invest it. I have the team on the ground. I have the number of investment with this team on the ground. And I know that I can scale that up to do even more investment with them. That's when we decided to sell the house and then use that equity and really 10x, 20x what we were doing on Martel Turnkey. And then this is where we did a lot more investment in single family rental. Almost instantly, like a couple of months later, after selling the house and getting that equity back in, I was able to make more money in net cash flow and flipping with that money invested that was able to cover all my rent, all my living expenses. And I was set. That moment, I can know exactly when I became financially free. And it's a few months after selling my house. So I was instantly an accredited investor. So that means I was able to invest in all kinds of different things that I was not allowed to invest in the past. And on top of that, I was financially free. I didn't have to work anymore. A few months later, I decided to tell my clients that I would wrap up this project and I would just basically leave the project, leave the company. I was an independent consultant at the time. This was the last project that I did for, for that company. So this is how I became financially free.